Praise the Lord. How many of y'all are glad to be in the house of God today? Give him a hand. Clap. We're just glad that we can come together and worship the Lord. We've had some exciting services. Next Sunday night, we're going to be having Don Bell from Ciderville with us. We've been sponsoring them for the last several months and everything, and they've been telling people about the church. We've been trying to get the word out there and all that. They've got some good music going on there. They, they play some gospel. They've got a bunch of country and bluegrass, and we as Ben Jam have played on there a bunch of times before, and they've always been good to us. So it just seemed like a nice idea to do. We went down there um, last, uh, what was that, last Saturday? Last Saturday we went on down there and they invited us back. So this Saturday, this uh, coming up one, we'll be down there again on television. That's on Comcast Channel 12. Am I right? Channel 12. And that's also on the internet. I think it's BBB TV 12 or something like that. But you can look them up and, and people can watch it all around the world. But we'll be there and uh, be there early, hopefully, this time. I think that they started shooting at 5. So they shoot two episodes a time. So we'll be there on next week's episode and the week after. And we're looking forward to that. We're looking forward to all the things that God's going to do. We've talked to so many schools this week and are just continuing to work with people through the community and see what we can do just to reach out and let people know about the Lord and just show the love of God here where we live. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Lord, gracious Heavenly Father, we pray right now that your spirit would come down, that you would just be blessed by the music, by the singing, and by our worship, Lord, that we could just come together and that we could glorify you, that we could lift up holy hands, clap our hands, stomp our feet, give you a praise and an amen, God, and that you would be glorified. And we pray, God, that you would touch every heart, every life, every mind. Hallelujah.
here today. Has God been good to anybody besides me? Hallelujah. He has just been so good to me. I can't even express it this morning. You know, just the fact that we're able to get up and breathe this morning. You know, there's folks that can't even breathe, that struggle to breathe. And I know what that feels like because I've struggled with asthma in previous years. And I almost died from it one time. I had such a bad asthma attack. And there's nothing scarier than when you can't get breath in your body. So even if, if you can just breathe freely this morning, you've got something to be thankful for. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's turn to page, I think it's 393. I can hardly read my own right, and I hope that I uh, wrote that down right. Yes, <laughs> it's 393. When we all get to heaven.
can sing and shout the victory. Hallelujah. But we can sing and shout that victory while we're here on earth. And I believe Amen. that's exactly what the Lord wants us to do. Not wait till we get to heaven. Amen. Let's turn to page 248. 248, just over in the glory land. <clears throat>
Let's turn to page 120. Victory in Jesus. That is only where our true victory Amen. lies this That's morning. Right. It's in Jesus Christ our Lord.
seeing my Lord again. I'm looking forward to him coming back. I'm looking forward to him coming back in those skies. You know, there's people in the world that say it'll never happen. And yet, the most historically accurate book and the most prophetically accurate book that has ever been written, hallelujah, came from divine inspiration of God, and it's this Bible. Hallelujah. There's things that had happened. People said years ago, I know the Lord's ready to come back. And there's things that weren't fulfilled yet that had been fulfilled in our lifetime and that are going on now that are set up, and he could be here any minute, hallelujah. I'm glad for the Lord. I'm glad that he saved my soul. I'm glad that he's touched my life. I'm glad that he's went with me. The eyes of God have watched over us at times when we thought that he's not there. I know I quote often that David said, if I make my bed in hell, he'll still be there with me. If I would take the wings of mourning and fly over to the other side of the world, he would still be with me. Hallelujah. The Lord's with you here today. The Lord's seen us and he's there with us and he loves us. And it's his desire to move in our lives. And we're going to we're gonna be preaching a little bit later on about the, uh, the time, the first miracle that Jesus had ever did. But it's his desire. Desire to, to bless us and just to move and just to work in our lives. Do y'all know that the first miracle that Jesus ever did in the Bible, that it wasn't a need? Do y'all know that? There where he turned the water to wine at the wedding. It wasn't a need, but it was a want. It was something that somebody wanted. That somebody that his mama just came and she asked him for. And he had a desire just to move and just to touch in those people's lives and no want. Just to enrich their lives and just to make their lives better than they were. He still has that desire today. And he still has the power to do it here today. There are things that the world says there's no way. There are times in this life where the world just brushes us off. Where they'll just turn their back on us. But we have somebody who cares. Aren't you glad that you know somebody that cares? Does anybody have a prayer request that you'd like to make known before the Lord here today? Because I know that he has the power to do it.
gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless this offering, that you would receive it in your, your hand. You know our needs are many. We pray, Lord, that you bless all those who have to give and all those who have not to give. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.
so thankful for the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, turn again into the book of John. Seeking the Lord this morning about what to preach on. This is where he had led me over to. In the book of John, we're going to begin reading out of the third chapter. I'm not one of these preachers that, uh, that hops around to a lot of uh, scripture. It's just going to be there in the second uh, chapter of, uh, of the Gospel of John. Hallelujah. And it begins to talk about a miracle that Jesus had worked, and particularly the first miracle that's ever recorded in the Bible that he had worked. Uh, his mother came to him, as we're going to read, at a party, and she came to him with a specific day in John chapter 2. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Listen now. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. I think it's important that we note that, the, that they're all there. And, and there's, there's a reason for that. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Let's pray. Lord, gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you continue to move. That you would continue to touch us here in this service, Lord. That you would continue to pour your spirit down, oh God, I feel you here today. We pray, Lord Father, that you would just cause our lives to be enriched with this word, Lord, and full of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, what a story this was. Jesus came on the scene and he saved the day. How many times have y'all heard the story? You've heard it quite a few times, haven't you? About Jesus changing the water into wine. I know that there's country songs that they want to pervert it. Man, Jesus changed the water into wine, so it's okay for me to booze it up. It's okay for me to get a little bit tipsy. It's okay for me to get a little bit drunk. And this isn't going to be a sermon that's bashing on wine, even though the Bible says that wine is a mocker and a strong drink raging, and any man that be the steed is on wise. Alcohol has ruined more families and more lives. More wives have been battered because of alcohol. More children have been left without because of alcohol. I have a lot of alcoholics that have been in my family on both sides of my family. And it destroys life and it's a horrible thing. And the world will nod it off and they'll just say it's a good time. Hallelujah. Well, it ain't a sin if you don't get drunk. Well, the Bible talks about it in such depth that you can see that there's something wrong there. I also also know that if, if we really got into it, and by no means am I an expert on making wine, but they do things today that are different than they even did back then. They would have to do stuff to preserve things. So I believe that the alcohol content history would show is higher in wine today. I also want to point out the fact that at that particular wedding, that these people, that they had several barrels of wine, and they had drunk it all, and then Jesus performed a miracle before we go any farther. Now let's just examine that in case anybody has a question about it in their mind. And Jesus performed a miracle and he made more wine. Now you have some people that they want to say, well, if you look at the Greek in the New Testament, that we know that it was, uh, there's no word for unfermented wine in the New Testament. Well, we also know that the Bible says that drunkenness is a sin. Do you remember Noah back there in the Old Testament? And he got drunk and he passed out. And drunkenness is a sin, and that's talked about in the Bible. So if Jesus would have turned that into ferment and wine, and if the alcohol content would have been what the alcohol content is in wine today, after they had already drunk that much wine, it doesn't make sense, does it? They would have got drunk, and he would have caused them to sin. So we know that that's not right. But Jesus, nonetheless, he performed a miracle here. And what a great story this is, because he took something that was ordinary. He said, I want you to fill these barrels with water. And he filled it with something that was ordinary. You know, that's the way that we've been in our life. We've been overlooked, and we've been dismissed, and we've been pushed down, and we've been held back because we're something ordinary. But he said, I want to make you into something extraordinary, into something of great value, hallelujah, into something costly. Water didn't cost money. I know it does today, doesn't it? Water, water kind of costs money. You go out to the machines and it'll be a dollar or something. I, I once went to an opera just because I wanted to go and I wanted to see what that would be like. $5 for a bottle of water. You know those people are crazy. $5 for a bottle of water and the drinking fountain wouldn't work, so I broke down and had to spend it anyway because I was just that thirsty. But... 
We know that he made it into something costly. There's a lot of stories in the Bible, and I want to look at more than just this, but there's a lot of stories in the Bible that kind of emphasize this sort of thing. I look at the life of Samson, and Samson could have been just like every other man, but God had a calling on his life. Amen. God put a standard on his life, and he was told that he was going to be a, a Nazarite all his life. His parents were told that. Now, that's more than just having long hair and, 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 and a beard and, and all that sort of stuff, because that was a deep religious vow, which is broken down in the Old Testament. There's a lot of things that you couldn't eat. There's a lot of things that you couldn't do. People want to say, man, I love that old John the Baptist, but I don't know if they would love him if they were his pastor, uh, because John the Baptist was a Nazarite. He couldn't go around a dead body. He would never visit a funeral home. He would never go to a funeral. He would never preach anybody's funeral, because that was part of their vow, that they wouldn't be around any dead thing. They wouldn't ever eat meat. I know that people want to say, man, he ate locusts and wild honey. Well, he didn't eat locusts and wild honey. And I had a woman get into it with me years ago when I explained that a locust is a nut that grows in that particular region of the world. It's, it's not like a grasshopper because he wasn't allowed to eat stuff like that because it's part of the vow. The Bible says neither kernel nor husk. There's a lot of stuff. I mean, it made your life hard. Your life was difficult if you were a Nazarite. It took an effort to be a Nazarite. It took a hard effort effort to be a Nazarite. You know, things that are, that are worth doing and things that are worth having, it almost seems like they're worth paying a great cost for. The Bible, Jesus began to tell us about a man in one story, and he said that there was a man and he was a pearl merchant. He knew all about pearls. He had researched pearls all of his life, and he found a pearl of great price. Do you know what he had to give for that pearl of great price? How many of y'all remember that? Everything he had. Hallelujah. Do you know that? Everything that he had, he had to put up for that pearl. He gave away all of his money for the pearl. You know, he could have said, well, how am I, how am I going to gonna afford my house? Well, will you have a house? Well, you got to give that too. He gave up his house. He gave up his family. He gave up everything that he had for that. You know, when we're walking for Jesus Christ and when we're living for Jesus Christ, the Bible says that if you're going to do it, if you're really going to walk this walk, you have to be ready because there's some things that you might have to give up. Father or mother, houses or land, there's somebody that's going to get in your way and they're going to say, I don't like this whole Jesus thing that you're all about. I don't like this whole Jesus thing that you're into. But hey, it could happen, couldn't it? And they can say to you, they can say, I just don't want no part of that. And if you're not willing to choose Jesus Christ over that person as near and dear and loved as they are by you, he says, you're not worthy of me. He said, if anybody puts their hand to the plow and they look back, they're not worthy of me. Remember Lot's wife is what the Bible says. Lot's wife looked back. God was leading them out. God was leading them into something better. God was taking them away from the filth and the sin and the corruption of this world that had tainted and stained and ruined their life. And she looked back to it. She thought about how much fun she had when they were living out there in Sodom. Hallelujah. And she looked back to it and she died in her sins and went straight to hell. Jesus Christ was there at the party. I think that that's something that when this sermon is preached it doesn't get enough emphasis ever. That Jesus was at the party. For you to ask Jesus to do something, for Jesus to come down and for him to work the miracle, he's got to be there. Amen? You've got to have Jesus Christ. Hey, you welcome Jesus Christ there. I know there's a lot of people that they want to call upon the name of Jesus, and they don't have him incorporated in their life. He never made the guest list. Jesus is never in the room with them. They, they've not brought him on board. You know, a lot of times it's apparent and it's plain to see. And we don't want to be all religious and say, well, man, you know, you can tell by the way that they're dressed and you can tell by the music that they're playing and you can tell by all these things that Jesus isn't going to be there because what kind of environment is that? But let me tell you the truth of the matter. All those things that are going on, they are merely a reflection of what's going on inside of that person. My exterior is a reflection of the inside of me. So if, if I have a can of beer in my hand, and I'm just sitting back and I'm swilling a beer, that can of beer is not so much of the problem, but there's something in me that tells me, hey, that's all right for me to do, and that's just a reflection of how I am outside. You know, you can say, well, well, you know, he ought to know better. Well, maybe, well, maybe I, I do. You know, but I mean, if I'm going around and 
if I'm living that way, and if I've got a certain certain uh, facade of whatever going on around me and everything that's going on, and if you're like, man, this just that doesn't seem right, it's a reflection of who I am inside. I know that we say that God doesn't look at the outside of a man, and he does look on the inside, and he does, and that's absolutely true. But do you know what? We should keep true to who we are on the inside, on the outside. How many of y'all know people do that? If somebody has an interest in something, if somebody has an interest in the, in the Tennessee balls, they don't try to hide it. They don't try to cover it up. They don't try to mask it. They make time for the Tennessee balls. They play the Tennessee balls on TV. I worked at J.C. Penny up in the sports section, and we would have tapes, DVDs of the Tennessee balls, and you could watch old Sister Jenkins over and over and over and over again. And, and we did. We didn't have a choice. And I had them burnt into my brain. And and people would come in there. And they would be excited. They would be fired up that there was a, a a new video about the Tennessee balls. There came a Bruce Pearl one, and I'm so sad that we lost him as a coach because I really liked him. And now Auburn's going to be whooping us a lot harder because they got him on board. But they were excited about it. People came in and they would buy the DVDs. And we would get a new polo shirt with the power tee on it. And, and we would get a, a new jersey in with somebody's number on it. And they would come in and buy it. And people got excited about it. They had flags and people would drive down the road and they would have the flags flying from their cars. They would have the posters stuck up on the wall of their heroes. People are the same way with music. You can know what band they liked by looking through their CD collection. You know, you'd say, this is the style of music they were, they're were they into. It's Southern Gospel, or it's country, or it's rock, or it's rap, or, or, or it's whatever. But you can look through them, and you can consecutively see, you know, that they have a collection of this person. You can see that they've got a poster of this person stuck up on their wall. I know a gospel singer, and she's like a hardcore Elvis fan. And when a guest will come over to, to her and her, her newlywed husband's house, and I'm sure he loves it, they have an Elvis room that the guests will stay into. And um, I was actually there at their wedding, and, and I think that I trumped all uh, wedding gifts because I knew how hardcore Elvis she was. I didn't know what he liked, but I thought, I'll give them a really nice gift, just sweet family. So I got them an Elvis like comforter and all for the bed. So anyway, I, I heard lately that Elvis is bleeding out of the room and beginning to, to go into the rest of the house. You wouldn't have to wonder if somebody in that house was passionate about the music of Elvis Presley or the movies of Elvis Presley or Elvis Presley in general. And they were excited that, man, if they liked Elvis movies, you wouldn't have to wonder. You wouldn't have to think about it. You wouldn't have to question it. You know, the important part of being a Christian isn't that somebody comes to the conclusion that I'm a Christian because I say I'm a Christian. Because there's a lot of people that they say they're one thing that they're not. If you all watch the political races, you know that. They say, I stand for this, and the, the, evidently not too strong because they change their mind. It's what are they standing on, um, or I stand for that, or here's my stance, or here's my thoughts, or here's what I am. But nothing seems to back it up. You know, we need to back that up. We need to have Jesus invited at that party, hallelujah. We need to have him there in our lives. You know, there's a lot of places in people's lives where they've not wanted the Lord at their party. I think back into the book of Daniel. And the Bible tells me that they were thrown this debaucherous affair. They were profaning the name of God. They began to get the things that were uh, holy out of the temple of God that they had taken. And they said, we're just going to go ahead and we're just going to booze it up and we're going to drink wine from them. And we're just going to have a good old time and laugh and spit in the face of Almighty God. I've heard that his history records that there were peacocks and they were carrying party trays through that place. There were dancing girls there. I mean, they had it going on. This was Hollywood. Uh, this, this was as big and as high up as you could be lavish affair. And they just felt really good about themselves. And let me tell you what, God wasn't on the guest list, but God crashed the party anyway. The Bible that tells me that it's better to fall on God than for God to fall on you. Because it's going to happen one way or the other. Amen? It's going to happen one way or the other. Either I'm going to fall before the mercies of God and declare Jesus Christ King of kings and Lord of lords and the Lord of my life forever and say, I want to serve you. I want to live every day of my life for you. Or it's going to be the other way around and I'm going to stand against him and we're going to have a meeting 
one day. I'm going to see him and we're not going to be on the best of terms. Because I said I choose to oppose you. Maybe not in words, but with my actions. There are some people so carnally minded that they can't even see the light of day when it's in front of their eyes. I think about it in the New Testament. The Bible tells me that after the, Jesus Christ had ascended up into the air, the Holy Spirit had fallen upon the disciples, that they were going out and they were doing great things by the power of Almighty God and the Holy Ghost in their lives. They were healing people. Demons were coming out of people. God's power was moving so greatly and so prolifically. And they came upon a sorcerer whose name was Simon. And Simon was so carnally minded, Simon was so full of the world, that he thought he could buy that power that they had. He didn't want to have a come to Jesus experience. He didn't want to get his life right. He just wanted the goods on the power. He wanted to live the same old way that he lived before, but he, but he wanted the luxury of having the power of the Holy Ghost in his life. We can say a lot of deep things about Simon. Simon was into witchcraft. Simon worshipped idols. Simon was a man who went out and, and did the opposite of what a Christian could do. Uh, Simon was a drug dealer, wasn't he? That's what the word uh, sorcery means. Pharmakia is from the original Greek. Like a witch doctor. They would give you stuff to get high off of. Is what they would do. Simon would go out and he felt like he had this power. He would talk to spirits and he would talk to demons and he would play with his Ouija boards and he would dabble in everything that the Bible tells you not to dabble in and he would worship everything that the Bible tells you not to worship in and he said, I still want this power of the Holy Ghost in my life. Well, let me tell you what, Jesus said there's only one way to get it. He said, I am the door and no man gets to the Father but through me, but by me. Do you know that that's the New Testament painting of the church? That that's the New Testament picture of the church? Jesus said, I'm the way. The church was called the way. Amen. Isn't that great? Do you like that? That the church was called the way? Amen. That's offensive to people. Victoria, do you know that's offensive to people? Because if, if I say the way that I'm following is the way, the only way, that tells you that if you're going any other way but the way that I'm going through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that you're wrong. You're not going to make it into heaven by praying to Buddha. You're not going to make it into heaven by following after the government. You're not going to make it into heaven by following any of these other false gods or any of these other things. You're not going to make it into heaven by being a good person. You know, you say, I'm a good person. And I'm there. And I'm kind to animals. And, 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 I mean, some people say, hey, I eat healthy. I don't even eat all that GMO crap that the, the government that they're trying to give me, that garbage and everything to, to feed into me. I don't eat that trash that they're trying to give me, that they're trying to make me sick on. But, but I eat organic, and I eat good, and I eat healthy, and I, tr I try to be good, and I try to be good in this way, and good in that way, and, and I give to charity. But the Bible, it tells me, it says that in the New Testament, it says this thing to me. It says that if a man would give all of his goods to the poor, if he'd give away everything that he had, if he would bless people, but if he didn't have the love of God in his life, if he didn't have God in his life, it says, I'm nothing. If I could speak with the tongues of men and angels, and if I had the power over language, if I had such faith that I could move mountains, that I could do great wonders, wow, if Simon could have that power of the Holy Ghost moving in his life, if God would just give it to him, but if he didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, he'd be nothing. Jannies and Jambres had power. They contended with Moses. They were wizards. They were witches. The Bible tells me that Moses laid his rod down on the ground and that it became a stake. And they said, we can do that too. And they did. That's scary, isn't it? That's scary power that they can do that. And he turned some water into blood. And they said, well, we can do that too. You know, it's funny to me that they never changed it back. It's funny to me that they couldn't undo what God did. But they could just make it worse. I would have fired them. I would have just had them so dead. I would have said, there's already a problem going on here in my kingdom. I mean, if I were Pharaoh, you know. There's already a problem going on here in my kingdom. And you just made it worse. You're dead. 
If we don't have Jesus at the party, we're never going to see our water turned into wine. If we've not welcomed him the way that we should, we're not going to see the water turn to wine in our lives. We're not going to see this church grow if we haven't welcomed the Lord into it like we should. Do you know that, that, that there's, a, um, there's churches and there's a bigger picture than just us as individuals with welcoming the Lord in? If, if our government doesn't welcome the Lord Jesus Christ there, the Bible teaches me that he's going to crash the party. That his hand is going to write on the wall. And that's going to be a dark and that's going to be a sad day when the hand of God pins on that wall. That you've been weighed in the balances and you've been found wanting. That's what it said, didn't it? That a judgment has come. You didn't want me at the party, but I'm showing up anyway. God's coming to the party at carpet. And he said, come on in. You're the guest of honor. who was insignificant and plain and average and normal and less than extraordinary. But Jesus Christ broke through the crowd and he came and he touched him. And Bartimaeus rose to his feet. He turned the water into wine in Bartimaeus' life that day because he said, come in, my Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. If we would just call on him, church, he can do such great things. the Lord. Do y'all know that? When we worship the Lord, we open the doors. The Bible says that he inhabits the praises of his people. If I'm not praising him, I'm saying keep out. If I'm not praising him, I'm saying go away. And I know we preach a lot about praising the Lord and how, man, the Bible talks so much about it that you could have devoted an entire ministry to it, couldn't you? It says clap your hands, oh you people. Isn't that good? That we can clap our hands and we can praise him. It talks about how hands. And we can talk about all the emotion and lifting up our voice unto the Lord because that is praise and that is worship. But let me tell you what it goes beyond that. Because it goes into how we live our lives outside of here. I heard so much talk about back in the day. Have y'all ever heard the talk back in the day? Some of y'all may have seen a little bit of back in the day. I don't know my, my, my grandma talks about it. It says, man, there, there were churches out there that they used to get 
a shout that God would work these miracles. But let me tell you something. Those people didn't wait till they got into church to have church. Those people didn't wait till they got into that place to have God doing something in their life. But they were fellowshipping with God before they even got into there. Hallelujah. Is that right? They were fellowshipping with God before they even got in there. They were praising the Lord and they were singing songs and they were reading their Bible and they were in the right mind and they were in the right spirit. Hallelujah. The Bible tells me that there on the day of Pentecost, when everybody was gathered together, that they were in all one mind and one accord. They had to get themselves right. They had to say, we need to get and have the mind of Christ. That's a problem with a lot of churches today is that they don't have the mind of Christ. It's a problem with so many people today, so many leaders today, that they don't have the mind of Christ. A preacher was here and he was preaching Sunday morning and he began to touch on a verse that is very near and dear to my heart. That without a vision of the people will perish. But let me tell you something. Sometimes somebody has a vision and their vision is wrong. Because there's a lot of people with visions that are going in different directions and sometimes it's wrong. Every political candidate that there is or has ever been that I've ever known of has had some kind of a vision. Barack Obama had a vision. George W. Bush had a vision. Adolf Hitler had a vision. Napoleon Bonaparte had a vision. Alexander the Great had a vision. Everyone has had a vision of some sort or another that has said, this is what I want to do, and this is what I want to accomplish. And let me tell you something about them in case I, somebody here doesn't grasp it. Every single one of them, I firmly believe, think that they're right. They, don't they? They think that they're right. I mean, if I didn't think I was right about something, I would turn around and I would go in the opposite direction. I would say, well, I'm not going to do that anymore because that's the wrong thing. The Bible says that there's a way that seems right unto man in his own eyes, hallelujah, but that the end of is destruction. There are people that think their way is right. The problem is that they don't have the mind of Christ. The problem is that they're not praying before they're acting, and that they're not putting a legs on their faith. The Word of God says this to me. It says that be not deceived, that faith without works is dead. Hallelujah. The one can't stand without the other. The one can't live without the other. If I say I'm one thing, but my works don't back it up, the way that I live my life doesn't back it up, then there's a problem. There's a problem. If I say Jesus is in my life, I've opened up the doors to him, and I've welcomed him in. Hallelujah. But everything about it says that it's not. And you begin to, to walk through there and it begins to look like the, the house of Nebuchadnezzar. And you see the, the, the dancing girls there and you see how the party's going on there. And you see all this carnal, secular madness that's there inside of me going on into my life that's bleeding out. You can kind of begin to wonder. But do you know what? I know that this thing is sure that God's showing up. Whether we want him to or not. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad for him? He's showing up. He's either coming in through the door where you're having it opened up through him for him, or he's kicking it in. Hallelujah. Our Lord can open doors. And our Lord can close doors. And if God wants to get in a door, how many of y'all know that there's no way that you're keeping him out? Hallelujah. People can lock me out and people can shut me up and people can press me down and people can hold me back because it's happened my whole life. I was called into ministry at the age of seven years old. I ran from it. Finally, I accepted the calling and I fought and fought and fought. And there's been so many opportunities that I would say, God, why haven't you allowed this to happen? Well, God, why haven't you had this happen? And sometimes there have been men and different people in my life, boards that I've sat before and they slammed a door in my face. And they said no for no good reason. And they said, you're just going to have to sit and wait when they didn't want to do anything about it. And where they said, I'll have to check my calendar. How many of y'all know sometimes that's just a good lie? I'll have to check my calendar. Or I'll have to pray about it. I think that that's just awful. I'll have to pray about it just to put me off or to, to, to push me aside. And there's people that will do that to you in your lives. And they'll just give you some answer that just doesn't even matter. And think maybe they'll go away. But I can't
something more than ordinary, something more than just like every other building that's sitting on the side of this road. How many churches are there on this road anyway? I mean, you, you can really take up some time counting. How many places are there on this road? And not a one stands out any more than the other. They just all kind of blend together. You see a school and you see a church and you see a salon and you just drive by them. And let me tell you something about that. And I'm not putting them down at all. But I don't know a single thing that's going on inside of any one of them. I'm sure that they're doing stuff and that there's somebody in there somewhere that's doing something for God. But I don't know about it. But this needs to be a place that shines. We need to shine for God. The Bible says that a city on a hill cannot be hid. I've heard people talk about it in, in history where Jesus is described in secular writings. Because the Bible says that when Jesus came to this earth, he didn't come looking pretty. Jesus didn't come where he was born in a palace and where he was handed everything. So he wasn't somebody that looked like a movie star. He wasn't blonde haired and blue eyed. But he just kind of looked like everybody else. But I've heard it said that from the reports of Roman soldiers and accounts from people that said that they saw him, that there was something different about this man. That there was something, even though he looked like he could live next door, there was something about him that was different that made him stand out. There was something that shined about Jesus that made him, where you knew that this isn't just a, a mortal man, that he's not just like everybody else. And that's how this church needs to be. And that's really, quite frankly, how we need to be and how we need to strive to be. More like him, hallelujah, because we can have a vision and it can be wrong if it's not the vision that he wants for us. The Bible, it tells us, it says that if you would delight yourself in the Lord and if you would put him first, Victoria, come up to the piano. And if you would put him first, that he would give you the desires of your heart. Isn't that good? He would give you the desires of your heart. People didn't need that wine in a wedding. They wanted it. And do you know why they got it? Because they made a point to have Jesus there. I want you to look at everybody else that we see that was on the guest list with Jesus. It was the people that were close to Jesus. Mary was there. And we read that the disciples were there. You know, I, I've said before that birds of a feather, a lot of times that they flock together. I've heard Dr. Bill tell people, he said, people that go to prison that have people that drag them down into bad situations. He said, as soon as you get out of prison, my advice to you is to never go back to that same town. Because those same people, before the sun goes down, will leech on to you and they'll try to drag you into a mess. The Bible says that wicked communications corrupt good manners. We know that we're affected by the people that we're around. The Bible says that iron sharpens iron. Hallelujah. So much as one believer to another. That's what we need to be. We need to build each other up and we need to encourage each other. We need to engross ourselves in the things of God and welcome the people of God into our lives and have influences that God wants to be there. Do you all know that here today? We need to have that. Well, and that if you would sick, sick them in a room with a bunch of sick people, all those sick people wouldn't suddenly become well because you stuck somebody that was good and healthy with them. But they would make them sick. They would tear them down. There's so many things that this world wants to put in our lives. And so many of them are sly because they don't seem like they're all that bad. The Bible says that the, that the little foxes spoil the vine. There's things that maybe they're not bad. And maybe there's nothing wrong with it. And maybe there's nothing wrong with it for that guy over there. But if it's keeping me from God, it's a problem. Amen? If it's keeping you from God, it's a problem. Maybe there's some TV show that you're watching and you're following it time and time again. And no, I'm not preaching on the soap opera. But you're watching it time and time again. And in that time, you can be reading your Bible. And it's consuming you and it's taking away time. We need to make the things that are the most important, the most important in our lives. We need to put them at the top of the list, at the top of the to-do list. My nephew was over at the house the other day and they played a commercial. And it was about people working out. And this is the number one reason people don't work out. Have you all seen this commercial? It's because they don't have enough time. And 
and I screamed out or cried of laziness, it's because they don't want to do it. It's because you don't want to do it. And if I didn't want to come to church, I wouldn't be here. If I didn't want to read my Bible, I wouldn't do it because I'd say I have no desire to do that. That's not a priority in my life. If I didn't want to watch some menial show on TV that I just enjoy watching, I, I wouldn't watch it. I'd say it bores me to tears. I wouldn't do it and it wouldn't be a part of me. And there was some group that I heard out playing somewhere and I thought they're not an account. I wouldn't buy their CD and listen to it over and over. But I do those things that are important to me and I make them a priority in my life. And we need to make Jesus Christ a priority in our life. And we need to make this book a priority in my life, in our lives. I heard a preacher preach the other night and he said, God wrote you the greatest love letter that there is. And so many people say that they love God, but they've never even read it cover to cover. They've never even read that book. They've never even read that love letter. The Bible, it tells me that this is, it tells me that it's daily nourishment for me. Every time I read it, I get something else out of it. Hallelujah. It feeds into me. I know if I would sit around and if I wouldn't eat and if I would starve myself to death, I began to get really hungry. I began to get really sickly. I can really preach on that here today because I was just on a low-carb diet. I just went for a week about it, and I said, that's enough of that. I'm just sick to death of that. Low-carb diet, I called it wrong at first. I called it a high-carb diet. I could really go for that, just eating potatoes all the time. But it, it drains you because you're not getting any of that carbs or anything in you, all that energy food that you want. You're not eating noodles, and you're not eating potatoes, and you're not eating anything that just gives you that get-up-and-go to it. We need more of God in our lives, church. Is every head bowed and every eye closed? God knows your lives here today. He knows your walk. He's seen you every time that you stumble. The Bible tells me that a righteous man falls down seven times and that he gets up seven times. It doesn't make us unrighteous because we stumble. It doesn't make us awful because we fall. But if you are a saint and a child of God and you're going to be with him, you need to keep getting back up. You need to shake the dust off your feet. You need to wash your hands of those things. Jesus said again, remember Lot's wife. He told him to leave. He told him to run from it. He told him to go another way because Jesus is the way. And she turned around and she looked back. If there's anything in your life that is hindering you from God, if there's anything in your life that's keeping you from getting closer to God, you need to pray. You need to pray that thing away, and you need to get that thing out of your life. Hallelujah. Do y'all know that here today? I want everybody to find themselves an altar somewhere, and I want them to call out to the Lord. Pray. If you live a perfect life now, and if, if, if you're where you should be with God, and you just keep increasing day after day, you just pray for everybody around you. You just pray for the people outside of these walls that aren't here, that could be here, that they're not really doing nothing. Just pray. Lord, gracious Heavenly Father, we pray, God, right now that you just move upon every heart, every soul, every mind. We pray, God, that you would remove every sinful thing and obstacle, God, that keeps us from getting closer to you. We pray in the mighty name Jesus Christ, God, that you would touch our lives, that you would cause something to rise up in our spirit, and that you would cause it to fight, to fight against all the evil. Lord, your word says to draw unto nigh unto you, to draw close to you, and you'll draw close to us, and to resist the devil, and you'll flee. It says both things. We can't just fight against the devil and not draw closer to you, God, and expect something to happen going to come back stronger, and he's going to come back meaner. We pray, God, that you would guide our paths and that you would direct them.
forsake us. This stands closer than a brother. The Bible tells me that Jesus Christ saw me when he was hanging on the cross, and he saw you, and he didn't see me at my best, and he didn't see me when I was all polished, but he saw me doing the worst garbage that I've ever done, and he saw everybody in here and everybody outside of these walls that has ever been doing the worst garbage that they've ever done, making the dumbest mistakes over and over again, falling over the same stuff over and over again, and he said, I love that person enough that I'm willing to give my everything because I believe that they can be something extraordinary. I believe that they can be more than normal, more than average, more than mundane, but I want to make something great out of their lives and I want to do something in their lives. Do you believe it today? Give them a hand clap. We love everybody that's here and uh, we want you to I keep praying to the Lord that he'll move on, on everybody's lives here and the lives of, of all the people outside. Like I said, we're doing a lot as an outreach. I know people that make excuses. I know churches that this church isn't really that big. Um, I know people that say, you know, we're small and we can't do much. But I know that God's going to do something extraordinary and we're going to keep fighting and we're going to keep pressing and we're going to keep trying. We just had revival. I have known entirely too many preachers that have told me, they said, I'm not going to have a revival because nobody will come. I'm not going to have a revival for this reason or that reason or the other reason. But the bottom line is, just like we were preaching today about so many other things, if you really want to have a revival, you're going to have a revival. If you really wanted to have a singing, you're going to have a singing. If you really wanted to come to church, you're going to come to church. And if I ever get a group that you all love and say, man, we want to have them back or that you don't want to have back, just put a bug in my ear and let me know one way or the other. Uh, so far, we've not been going long enough to have any repeats. But just let me know what you like, what you don't like, because your opinions do matter, and you do matter. Um, I don't look at anybody here and say, we're just going to pass film by, but your thoughts really matter on it, because we are the church. The church isn't this building. The church isn't this walls. The church isn't just a place. It's on 961 East Tri-County Boulevard, Oliver Springs, Tennessee, 3... 37840, that's not just what the church is. The church is you and you and you and you and you and so on. That's what the church is. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. We'll be having service here tonight at 6 p.m. Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Uh, we'll have Don Bell from Ciderville. He said he's going to bring a bunch of people. We'll see. Somebody needs to challenge that and come here Sunday night next week and, uh, and find out. But uh, he said that he's got a, uh, got a powerful testimony that he wants to share. Super nice guy. I know that he works in the school system around here. And he's, he's been a good friend. And he's really promoted uh, Benchmark Church. Announce the rummage sale. Yes, thank you. We will be having a rummage sale, a church rummage sale. Money coming in instead of going out, people. Uh, we'll be having a church rummage sale on May the 2nd. That's a Saturday. Hopefully everybody that gets a check has to check already because we're, we're hoping on it and we're counting on it. But it will be May the 2nd. That's a Saturday. Rain or shine. I'm hoping that it shine because I guess everybody in here knows that it would do a lot better if we had it set up by the road instead of like in the basement down there. It'd be less work, but it would be more fruitful work if we had it outside. So we're really hoping for that. Um, if you can be here and help with it, be here and help with it. If you just want to swing by, swing by. It'll be one more car for people to see, but we'll be down here working on that. And uh, we have a lot of things that we've already got done, a lot that we want to get done. We're getting gutters put in. Uh, we're dealing with a lot of situations to keep rain from pouring in the building and all kinds of nice things like that. Um, we're doing more advertising things, more community outreach things, all sorts of stuff. Praise God. Anybody else got anything to say? All hearts and minds clear. Shake a hand and be friendly tonight at 6, Wednesday 7. God bless you all.